victim mentality and victim mindset. That is what I would like to talk to you all about today. Uh, David V. Stewart here, uh, dvspress.com, davidvstewart.com. Um, before I get to this, let me do a little bit of housekeeping. If you don't see me on YouTube or you don't see me on social media for the next uh, however long, it's because I'm having surgery the day after tomorrow and I'll probably be recovering from that. I don't know how long. I don't know really what to expect. I will talk more about that at the end of the video because it will actually tie in a little bit to what I'm going to talk about right now. I want to talk about the victim mentality or the victim mindset. I'm aware, by the way, if I use the word mindset, it uh, immediately makes me think of Mike Cernovich. Uh, who talks about mindset constantly. He wrote a book called Guerrilla Mindset, and that's great. Um, you can go watch him. I know some of you might watch him or might read his uh, his blog or read his book. Um, this is not my attempt to rip him off. It's just mindset's a really good word for what I'm talking about here. And what I'm going to talk about is mostly, I would say at this point, it's like hypothetical. It's just an idea at this point um, for this uh, sort of theory that I have working. But I want to present it to you. I want to talk about it uh, with you because I've been talking about it a lot lately with friends and other people, and I've been thinking, of, thinking about it a lot lately as well. So what is the victim mindset? Uh, I would define it as when a person internalizes and makes part of their identity and uh, their worldview, their vision, um, the status of victim or being a victim, a victimhood. Um, and that's more than actually feeling like a victim or being a victim. It's making it part of one's identity. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, how I see this happen and um, why I think people can fall into this trap and why um, people do fall into the trap, what benefit they get from, from that sort of therapeutically and why you would probably want to avoid um, letting yourself uh, sort of get into the victim mindset and the victim mentality. Um, and the reason that I talk about it being internalized and part of your identity is because we're all, um, you know, we're all victims on some level, right? Like everybody's probably had something bad that's happened to them, um, or you're the victim of, um, it, especially when people are talking about victim classes. Like if you are listening to someone who's going to discuss intersectional feminism, they're going to talk about classes of people that are victims. Um, if you're talking about something like that, like disadvantage, everybody has some amount of advantage or disadvantage. Um, so what is the difference between that and internalizing that and making that part of an identity? There's there's a couple of steps that have to happen. The important thing about what defines a victim um, for this discussion is that a victim has had things happen to him or her that are not the fault of the victim. That's why they are a victim and not uh, a responsible party. So if you're walking down the road and a drunk driver hits you, uh, you are a victim of that drunk driver. You're a, you're a victim. But if you drive drunk and you crash your own car into a tree and, and damage yourself, you know, hurt yourself or kill yourself, that's just because you were acting negligently. You're not a victim in that circumstance. At least most people not classify you as a victim um, unless you went to like really extremes and, and you're like part of the victim class and it was, wasn't your fault that you were drinking somehow because you were a victim. And that's really where the victim mentality can and victim mindset can sort of take over a person's worldview. Um, so the important characteristic of that is that it's not your fault. And uh, when you internalize and make that part of your identity, you're making part of your identity, part of your worldview that it's quote, it's not your fault, that whatever situation you're in is the result of your victimhood, result of being a victim of something, and not the result of your actions. Now, for some people, that's the case. And for all of us, that's 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 the case on a certain level. Um, why it's dangerous uh, from a mentality perspective, from a mindset perspective, is that if you view your situation as being the result of of things that are out of your control, just like a person walking down the street getting hit by a car, you know, is not doing things that are, you know, they're not choosing to get hit by a car. So if, you're, if your situation is the result of things that are out of your control, then that creates for you um, a set of mental expectations that your that situations, especially your situation, if they're not the result of anything that's in your control, then your situation can't be the result of something that's in your control. So there's nothing you can do to change or fix your situation if you're in a bad one. And um, in a lot of cases, our, our mindset affects what we view as possible. And if you don't see um, it as possible for you to have averted what is 
you know, whatever bad thing might be going on in your life, then you're not going to see any path to get out of that that bad situation that you might be in. And um, it's subtle. Now, why, why do people fall into this? I mentioned it's because it removes fault, right? If you're a victim, you're not at fault. So you don't have to, um, you don't have to persist in dealing with feelings of guilt or remorse, or you could pretend that those feelings are illegitimate and shouldn't be paid attention to, or you can try to medicate them away or try to use therapy to help resolve them. And of course, I'm not talking about people who are having legitimate feelings of guilt from being a victim that are not uh, appropriate or helpful, right? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about people who make this part of their identity and part of their worldview. It's a constant, consistent thing. I mentioned earlier intersectional feminism. You see this, I, or at least I see this mentality a lot with people um, that are really big into sort of identity politics and what their identifiers are that sort of make them who they are. And if victim of something is part of one of those identity things, like, you know, you, everybody has like a list of identity, like, you know, uh, I'm black, I'm from North Carolina. I, you know, I drive a Mazda. I went to this college, I'm six feet tall. And, you know, you know, you have this list of things that like make up, sort of make up you in a certain way, right? And a lot of those things are not in your control. If you're black, that's not in your control. Uh, you know, I'm white and Cherokee. That's not in my control. That's just my heritage, right? Um, so if you make the victim, the victim part, that's obviously not part of your control. But if you're part of a victim class, and victim classes can be something as broad as women. Um, it can be something as broad as like, um, you know, people who are poor, right? So because you weren't, you know, you're born into poverty, you didn't choose what family you were born into. So you're a victim of your circumstance of poverty. That's where I see this most fall into it. And um, the reason that I think it's appealing to people, like I said, it helps you sort of avoid the negative feelings that come with um, being in a bad situation or making bad choices. Um, but then it, it eliminates what you might see as a possibility for getting out of that situation. Um, and I'll just give you an example of why um, negative emotions that come from bad things happening are not necessarily bad. And there's like many dimensions that you can look at for responsibility uh, that I think don't necessarily diminish victimhood. So as an example, let's say I'm walking in the park and I get mugged, right? So someone comes up and they steal my wallet. Now, um, at that point, I'm a victim, right? I'm a victim of armed robbery. Uh, so what have I lost in this? And I'm, you know, I'm speaking from a rational person who hasn't just been mugged and isn't experiencing any emotions about it. But you know, it's like, oh, I lost my wallet. I've had that wallet for 20 years. That sucks. I lost, you know, they took all my credit cards. Um, so that is going to be very inconvenient for me to get those credit cards uh, turned off and replaced. You know, and they took my driver's license. I'm going to have to go ask for another driver's license. That's going to be a big pain. You know, it's going to be very, very inconvenient. And they took $100 from my wallet and getting that $100, making back that $100 is going to be inconvenient for me. Now, it could be, I can imagine another person having that same situation, you know, having that happen. They get mugged in the park and it's just, it's going to be a crisis because they needed that last $100 to like buy food or something like that. And uh, now their life is in crisis and it's none of their fault. Now, the other thing that's following that, you know, this little scenario made up in my mind of being mugged is I'm like, okay, so... I, I'm not a moral fault for being mugged, but I was walking in the park at night. So if I want to avoid being mugged in the future, I'm going to not walk in the park at night. And if I feel regret, it's like I should have known not to go walking in this park at night. I should have known that that, is a, and that carries a risk with it, that that might be a place where somebody is looking to ambush and rob me, right? So if I'm feeling a negative emotion, regret, a, a, a dysphoric emotion, let's say, the regret, well, that regret serves to make me make a better decision in the future where I don't get robbed and I don't suffer all the in inconveniences that I'm going to suffer from being robbed in the first place. Um, we go to that second scenario or the second person gets that I'm imagining gets robbed and it's a crisis. They're like, how am I going to eat? I needed that $100. Now I don't have a driver's license. No one's going to believe who I am. Um, you know, if a cop pulls me over, he's going to arrest me and throw me in jail because I don't have a driver's license and I'm going to get pulled over. Um you know, I don't have any credit cards. I have no way to get money. Um, how am I going to do this, right? And so for me, it, 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 I could imagine like someone being in crisis about it and, you know, falling into despair and like, how, how am I going to survive this? 
And even if I were in that situation where like I needed that last hundred dollars really, really bad, like I needed it to eat. And believe it or not, I have been in these situations. Uh, I have been desperately poor where I had to like, uh, you know, turn in change to go buy groceries so I could eat that week, right? Um, well, I'm just thinking of my own situation. Like, how am I going to make a hundred dollars? Well, I could walk like half a mile from my house to an orange orchard because I live, I live pretty near the country. I live kind of out in the country and be a day laborer and make a hundred dollars in like one day or a day and a half of work if I'm really like lazy and not good at picking oranges, which I probably, I, I'm not a professional orange picker. So I don't really, I don't have the expertise of like somebody who's been, been farming their whole life, but maybe it takes me in a day and a half to earn those oranges. That's very inconvenient and that's extra work, but I know how to make a hundred dollars if I need to. Uh, but I know lots of people that that situation wouldn't even be conceived of as a possibility because that would involve personal action that would involve like quote lowering yourself to the like the the status of a laborer which i i have no problem with i've been a laborer whatever uh, everybody does different stuff like i would be a day laborer to feed my family in a heartbeat and i wouldn't feel the least bit bad about it and i wouldn't feel like i was taking a step down about it either because it's just work it's just work you know, what's the big deal? So um, that's my mindset for that. It's like, I would find a way to make the $100 back. If I really needed the $100, I have no doubt about it. But I could see how other people could could imagine this $100. Like, this is a crisis. I'm going to get, you know, I'm not going to eat this week because I don't have $100. When st- I, I've heard so many of these stories like that, that it's like, well, what do you mean? Go find a way to make money. If you have to go hustle aluminum cans, you can you can do that. Bums on the street go hustle aluminum cans. They, they're actually not going hungry and they're still drinking booze. They're finding money to do it, right? So it's it's a it's a big thing about mindset. And that's a that's a really good example. And even if you imagine something and, and I can take a, a page out of my the book of my own life is my father was killed and um, he worked at a mine. Now he was not killed due to his negligence. However, there's a certain risk associated with working at a mine, right? So is there a certain amount of responsibility? Yes, we all have a certain amount of responsibility for our situation is what I'm getting at. And therefore, if we have responsibility, if we have self-ownership of our actions, that means that we also have actions which can change our situation. So if your situation is the result, it has, uh, your, it has no relationship to what you've done. So that's the victim mindset coming in. Your situation has no relationship to your actions. Then your actions can have no effect to alleviate the, the situation if it's a negative one. That things are just random or arbitrary or the result of fate or some other malicious force like uh, racism or sexism in the world and not the result of people making choices. But if you recognize that your situation is a result of choices, even if they're not like non-moral choices, you know, if they're not, uh, you haven't acted immorally, but you maybe didn't make the best choice. Like you chose to take out a loan when you shouldn't take a loan, put something on a credit, you know, you bought too much stuff on your credit card. Those are all bad decisions. They don't make you a bad person. It just means you didn't have the best judgment when you did that. Well, it's just like, okay, well now I'm in debt because I made not the best choices. So now I'm going to make better choices to get myself out of debt. Right. And so if you see that possible, if you see the result of your actions, then there's actions that you can do that'll have a positive effect. So that's how you need to, that's that's the reason that you kind of need to avoid this this victim mentality. Um, so while in the moment the alleviation of negative feelings and the feeling of responsibility may be appealing from a therapeutic perspective, um, in the long run it's okay to feel badly and feel lots of negative emotions when something bad happens. Um, that's natural, and then uh, those are in turn going to help you inform and motivate you to to make future decisions that are going to improve your situation. So that's the whole bit of what I call like the victim mindset. And like I said, I see it a lot with identity politics. And if you're um, someone that really views identity strongly as affecting your life outcomes, it's going to be really easy to fall, I think, into this little trap and and believe that your situation is not only not the, res- is not the result of your actions, but now that cannot be resolved by your actions. If you view yourself as if you're a woman and you say, well, you know, there's no there's no women who do this, and so therefore I can't do that um, because I'm a woman. Or you know, women are never successful in business because of sexism. So why would you ever try to be successful in business, right? People want to want to do the things that they view as possible. But if you say like, well, you know, um, there's not a lot of women who choose to do these sorts of businesses, but 
I feel motivated to do it and I think I'd be good at it. I'm going to give it a try. And you may find that you're very successful. And just because other people didn't do it uh, doesn't mean you can't do it, right? So it all it, it all comes down to, to how what you view as possible. Um, and if you view yourself as a victim, then you're not going to view, you, you may be shedding off these avenues of possible advancement, possible self-action and advancement. And so if you fall into the victim class mentality or, you know, if you, um, if you let victim class dictate a big part of your identity, then that's going to in turn make you let, make it less possible for you to see yourself as as like a self-willed, actionable being that's going to make a positive change in your life and for the better. You know, so that's really good. Now, now, what does this have to do with my surgery? I mentioned I was going to bring surgery back into it. So I'm having surgery for those of you who who care about this. Um, and what they're going to do is they're going to make an incision back here, and they're going to drill into my skull. <laughs> They're gonna drill a little. They're gonna drill like a little divot, and they're gonna put in a piece of metal that's called an abutment. And what it really is, it's the end of a little metal transducer that will be implanted into my skull, in my into my mastoid bone, which is behind the ear. And what that will do is, after it's healed, um, you attach an amplifier to it, and it basically acts like a tiny little speaker, um, and will vibrate my skull using an amplifier, using a hearing aid. So it's a part of what's called a bone anchored hearing aid. What the bone anchored hearing aid will allow me to do is to actually hear out of my right ear because I can't hear out of my right ear. I have unilateral deafness um, and significant hearing loss. Let's just put it that way, a lot. I don't hear good. Um, now, the reason I can't hear to my right ear, hear out of my right ear is that um, I have uh, basically a, a destroyed ossicular chain. And you can actually look into my eardrum and I also have a perforated eardrum that's chronically perforated. It was, uh, it's a medical condition as such that actually kept me out of the army. Um, and uh, because the, you can't go swimming when you have a, a hole in, permanent hole in your eardrum. Uh, and the, the unilateral deafness thing actually qualified me as disabled. And you can't join the army if you're already disabled. Um, although, little side note i do have a friend um who was a navy seal and he's like i loved having a perforated eardrum because it got me out of diving for for a certain amount of time because he's like diving is really hard and i just didn't want to do it for a while so i got out of it they're like whoa mike are you going on the dive no i got a perforated eardrum can't go on the dive you know uh, but anyway mine is chronically perforated and if you look in you can actually see into the hole in the eardrum you can actually see my ossicles you can see my little ear bones uh, visibly with the with the eye which is profoundly strange when I've when I've looked at it on monitors and stuff at the doctor's office um, but anyway my, my ossicular chain doesn't work so this just bypasses that whole need to have the bones vibrating against the tympanic membrane against the eardrum and then going to the cochlea to produce sound it's just going to go straight through the bones to the cochlea and stimulate my nerves and I'll be able to hear yay it'll be really cool now um so that I'm a little nervous about it. I I've had so many surgeries growing up. I I really shouldn't care that much about surgery. I had, I had like 20 surgeries at least growing up, right? I've had a lot of work done uh, on my ear and, and things like that. So I really shouldn't be that nervous about it. But uh, you know, um, you know, you, you always get a little anxious about things that are unknown. It's it's pretty natural, and especially when some when you're going to go under the knife, it's pretty natural to be a little anxious about it. So I am a little anxious about it. Um, now. How does that affect this this victim mentality thing? Is that I'm a musician, right? And uh, this thing is not my fault, <laughs> right? I got, I've had this since I was a baby, so I can't even say I, I don't have a moral fault. It's not a failing of judgment. It's in no way really my fault at all that this is this way because there's nothing I could have done differently that would have changed the outcome of my ear. Um, absolutely nothing at all. So it's totally not my fault. I'm a victim of bad luck that has has made this ear this way um but i don't really think of it that way right i don't just i don't sit around thinking about how it's like ruined my life or something like that occasionally i get frustrated because i can't understand what somebody is saying but then i go to the other side of them and put my good ear to them and then i can kind of hear what they're doing you see like there's guitars in the background um i was a professional performer for like 10 years um i didn't let the fact that i couldn't hear fully stopped me from using what hearing I had to do the thing that I really wanted to do, which was to make music and to do it at a very, very high level. Now, that doesn't mean my life is free from limitations. Limitations are real. We all have them, right? You know, it's like, I'd love to be a center in the NBA, but I'm only six foot one. I'm not six foot 11, right? Um, 
Shaquille O'Neal was born at a really, really good advantage compared to most people because he was seven feet tall. And when you have a body like that, being um, being one of possibly you know one of the greatest sinners in the history of the NBA, it's it's something that is not only possible, but it's it's easy to do compared to other people, right? You have very severe limitations with whatever your life happens to be. You could be born paraplegic be born paraplegic that that's a real limitation on your life but if you view yourself as a victim then you're not going to see any way that for your life to be productive you're gonna be like oh well you know i'm i'm useless in this wheelchair it's like no uh, there's still things you can do um in your wheelchair jason becker um who's a really famous guitar player has uh, als the same disease that uh Lou, you know sometimes called Lou Gehrig's disease um but it's the it's the Stephen Hawking has that disease, and Stephen Hawking still does work. Jason Becker composes music, I think, with just like the twitches of his eyes um, at this point, which is really really cool that he's not, uh, despite limitations, he's still attempting to do what he what he really cares about doing. So I haven't let that limitation really stop me from doing what I want to do. But the opportunity is there to eliminate that limitation. Let's take it. Let's see if we can eliminate that limitation a little bit, and. Um, yeah, so I've never let that really hinder my progress. And, you know, there's there have been times where I've been losing more of my hearing and I'm like, eventually I'm going to go deaf. Well, what does that mean for me? Well, that means I can't play music anymore. Uh, but that doesn't mean that I'm useless. That doesn't mean I can't make like a video for you or I can't write something. I can't write a book. There's still lots of things that I feel like I could have a lot of passion doing. Um, and I wouldn't stop and sit around and be, you know, feel like that my life had had gone in a bad direction because of no fault of my own, even if it was for no fault of my own, because I view my actions as being effective in the world. And that's really what I'm getting to. You have to view your actions as being effective because if they're effective, that means whatever you need to change, you can change. Whatever can be changed, whatever you want changed, it's possible for you to actionably change it. And if you view your life as being the result of nothing of your action, then you're not going to see that possibility. So that's how I really want to tie it all together. Don't let um, don't let the limitations of your life decide whether or not you're going to you're going to do something that you really want to do. Um, find a way to do it. Um, view your actions as having a meaningful impact and being possible to change whatever things you want in your life. And I promise you. Um, stick with it and you'll be able to you'll be able to do the things that you want to do you'll be able to write that book you'll be able to create the movie whatever whatever thing you have in your heart that it's possible to do um, you can do it so that's my positive pep talk for that thank you so much for watching don't forget to like comment and subscribe and let me know down below what you think about the victim mindset and the victim mentality um, i hope to see you all on the flip side of that but if you don't see me for a while you know where i'm at i wish you all good luck and i will be monitoring the comments as best i can even once i get out of surgery so have a great one and uh, i'll see you later